Hello everyone and welcome to the Sensor Plane Photography Podcast, where light and technology come together. I'm your host, Jason O'Dell, and today I want to talk a little bit about some outdoor wildlife photography. And the reason is I just returned from a trip that I take every year to private photo blinds in South Texas, where I lead a small group of photographers to do bird photography. Now, bird photography has been one of my favorite things to do ever since I picked up a camera. I'm sure most people have probably tried to take a picture of a bird at some point in their lives, and you realize pretty quickly that it's a challenging endeavor. Uh, birds are a lot smaller than you think they are, um, and they tend to be really skittish. So when we're taking pictures of birds, the most important thing to be able to do is get close. And by getting close, we've got two ways of doing that. We can get physically closer to the birds, or we can use long focal lengths. And realistically, for the best pictures, we're going to do both. Now, I'm going to talk about my trip to Texas at the end of the podcast. But what I want to talk about first was some of the equipment and settings that you would use for bird photography. Um, like I mentioned, when you want to shoot birds, these are very small, very fast-moving subjects, and you need to get close to them. So our basic ingredients are going to be a, a DSLR, anything that has a reasonably fast frame rate, um, anywhere from 5 to 10 frames per second, depending on your camera. And you're going to want to use, you know, a, hopefully you've got a fairly newer camera. Um, focal length considerations for birds we usually want to be using equivalent focal lengths of 500 millimeters or longer. Now, if you're using a crop sensor body, uh, like a Nikon DX or a Canon APS-C body, you can use a shorter uh, actual focal length because the crop factor uh, crops away some of the, the excess and you get effectively a magnified image. So on a, on a Nikon, for example, an APS-C sensor, you could use a lens that has a focal length of 400 millimeters and that gives you an effective angle of view as if you were using a 600 millimeter lens. And as you're going to see, as you get out there with the smaller birds, these little tiny guys, um, you, you might even go longer. And that's where things like teleconverters uh, come into play. The other thing you can do is use a camera that has a higher resolution. And that'll allow you to crop down a little bit more while still keeping a lot of pixels on your subject, uh, making for a sharp image. But I want to show you about my bird kit, um, and one of the things I want to do first is talk about getting all this stuff to your location. Because if you're like me, you might not live somewhere where it's a great birding destination. I've got to fly from Colorado down to Texas or to Florida or wherever, and that usually means putting your equipment on some kind of aircraft. So I want to show you my bag that I'm using with my kit and a few things in there uh, to, to make it uh, clear as to how you might want to pack this stuff up. Okay, so here I've got the bag that I use when I'm transporting my big telephoto lenses on an airplane. Um, it's no fun to have to carry these things through an airport, so I go with a wheeled bag and this one in particular I really like. This is the Think Tank Photo uh, Airport uh, Security 2.0 and it is a fantastic bag for lugging heavy things through an airport. Now this bag has standard carry-on dimensions so it'll fit in the overhead bin of most aircraft. International outside of the US where they have slightly smaller uh, carry-on rules um, this bag might not work. There is a variant of this bag called the Airport Internationals, um, which is the same bag, just a little bit smaller. It meets all international carry-on requirements. And if you're creative with it, you can fit a 600 millimeter lens in it if you need to. Now a 600 is the extreme end. That's a huge lens. 600, uh, about the same as a 400 f 2.8 lens. But if you're using something like a 200 to 400 um, or a 500 f4 for birds, this bag and the Airport International are going to uh, totally work. Now this bag is fantastic because um, not only is it wheeled, it extends out, you can put your briefcase on, on the handle, wheel it through the airport so you don't break your back and your spine, but it's also got, um, if you look down here, this is an integrated um, TSA lock right here on the front of the bag. So when you zip it up, you can you can snap it in there and the uh, 
you know, if anybody, if you, for, for some reason, if you needed to plain side check it, it will lock um, and it, it, they won't tear it open. Uh, the other part about this bag is it's got a mesh uh, spandex elastic compartment on the front. You can slide a laptop case. This comes with a small laptop case. You can even use it to wheel your laptop around. But let's take a look at what I've got inside this bag here uh, specifically. So we open her up and this is my kit. I've got my Nikon D4 body in here. I've got, a, as a backup, my Nikon D800E, okay? Uh, both will work. Uh, the advantage of, mostly I will use my D4 for birding because it gives me 10 frames per second burst rate and slightly faster autofocus acquisition and tracking than the D800. Even though they use the same autofocus system, the D4 is slightly faster. Um, I've got in here some extension tubes, which allow me to focus slightly closer with the big lens. If a bird comes into where I'm in the blind, uh, the 600 millimeter lens has a, a um, minimum focus distance of about uh, 17 feet. This will let me focus a little bit closer. Here are my teleconverters. I've got a 1.4 and a 2X teleconverter tucked right in here. Here's my charger for my camera my don't go anywhere without it um, Giotto's uh, rocket blower for cleaning dust off now one lens I did bring uh, this is the 70 to 200 f4 it actually works really nicely with the 2x teleconverter on my d4 and I was using that for birds in flight another really good option for bird uh, photographs if you're shooting Nikon is something like the 80 to 400 um, the new one um, f5.6 it's a zoom it's VR it's really really sharp some of my clients use that and have gotten excellent results now the last piece in this is obviously the big lens and here it is the 600 millimeter lens but what I want to show you on the here's the 600 millimeter lens it's just um, absolutely enormous but I want to show you a couple accessories that I have on on this lens um, the hood that comes on the 600 millimeter lens is um, really good. Uh, it's a two-piece carbon fiber hood and it extends out really far and it makes packing this lens tr pretty difficult. And that reason is, is because you can't get a nice open compartment. You have to have a really wide and then it tapers down to, to the small end here. So what I have used instead of the Nikon lens hood when I'm traveling is this little guy from Aquatech and it's called a soft hood and it's velcro and it just goes around the front of the lens it velcros on works great works fantastic and I can pack it it's light it doesn't weigh much works just fine um, I really like it and then instead of putting on the lower lens cover the sock as you will I've got this also from Aquatech this is a silicone uh, soft cap and it just plugs right in there and it's a nice lens cap for use with my 600, but they also make ones that fit uh, for the 500, the 200 to 400, lots of different lens sizes. So these accessories here allow me to pack this bag far more uh, snugly uh, and fit as much stuff in it as I want for when I'm traveling. And then the whole thing zips up and I just wheel it through uh, the airport I haven't had any problems going through security with it. Now the other component of my birding rig is my tripod. And for that, um, I've got my big 5 series Gitzo, which I use with, exclusively with my 600 millimeter lens. That lens I have to put in my checked luggage. It is just too big to carry on. So I go, it goes in my rolling duffel bag uh, surrounded by all my other stuff. But all the important, really expensive things comes with me on the plane in the overhead bin and it works. Okay, so now that I've shown you how I get my gear to my field location, let's talk a little bit about camera settings because that's another important thing. When you want to set up your camera for action, and birds are a perfectly good example of action, even if they're not moving fast, they're going to be moving quickly through the frame, we're using telephoto lens. How are we going to set up our camera? Well, the two things I want to talk about with specifics towards birds are the focus settings and the exposure settings. 
Let me start with the focus settings for how I set up my camera. Your camera has typically, if it's a DSLR like this one, is going to have two focus drive modes. Something called single shot or single servo focus. And that's the one where you focus, it locks, you recompose, you shoot. And then another mode called continuous servo or continuous drive focus. That always tries to change the focus, you know, to compensate for movement in your subject or movement by you. So we want to use continuous focus, continuous servo drive, so that the focus is always trying to lock on to whatever is under the autofocus point. The other component of focus is the autofocus points that you choose. Now, this Nikon D4, which is a top-end DSLR, it has 51 autofocus points. And I can group them in groups of 9, 21, or I can even use all 51 points if I want to. When I group the autofocus points, you're making the sensor somewhat larger, but you're decreasing accuracy and you're decreasing responsiveness. The reason is, is that the more autofocus points your camera has to process, to look at, the slower the, the CPU, the computer inside this camera, gets taxed. And that's really important for cameras that aren't D4s because they're going to slow down. They're not going to be quite as fast. So I use single point focus whenever possible, and I use it for two reasons. First is what I already mentioned. It's faster. The, the camera will be the most responsive if it only has to look at a single autofocus point. The second reason that I use single point is that it's more accurate to focus. When I group points into a large group, focus might lock on the shoulder of the bird and not the eye. And that means you're going to be just slightly out of focus on that part of the subject that you want to really nail in focus. So single point focus, continuous servo, that's the way to run when you're shooting uh, wildlife and birds most of the time. Now flight shots, different story. When you've got a bird flying, it's a farther distance and you're trying to keep a focus point on it, then your dynamic or your group focus points work great. But for more static subjects or close-ups, use that single point. The second thing I want to set up is the exposure settings on the camera. Now, you probably guessed already that with action and moving subjects, we want to use a fast shutter speed. That's going to be the predominant driver of the quality of our shots. We want to freeze that action. And let me tell you, with birds, it is absolutely critical. Now, the old adage back in the days of film was if you could shoot at a thousandth of a second uh, to freeze action, you're doing pretty well. Unfortunately, what you'll find with your digital cameras and the telephoto lens, if you can get really close to birds, is that you're not going to have a very good keeper rate on these little twitching subjects. They move so quickly through the frame that a shutter speed of a thousandth of a second is not always fast enough. So what do you do? I'm going to set it to two thousandth of a second. But here's the kicker. Instead of just setting my camera into shutter priority or time value, um, I'm going to do a couple of different things. I'm going to use, first of all, auto ISO. Because when I'm looking through my camera, the bird's in the shade, the bird's in the sun, and I do not have time to figure out if there's enough light here or there to shoot at 2,000th of a second. And so sometimes I might need to use ISO 200 or 400. Other times it might need to be ISO 1600 or heck, 6400. And let me say, with today's camera, any camera that's been come out in the last two or three years, the ISO performance is so good that you can shoot at ISO 3200, 6400, pretty much with reckless abandon. So don't, don't worry about a little bit of noise. Sacrifice that to get a sharper shot because you can clean up the noise. It's usually not very bad at all. I shot this camera at 6400, no problem. But instead of shooting it at shutter priority, which is going to let the aperture vary as well, I'm going to shoot it in full manual exposure mode. And what that does is it lets me dial in the shutter speed and the aperture. Why is that important? Well, I can shoot my 600 f4 wide open. That's true. Um, most lenses, even my 600, perform a little bit better and are a little bit sharper if you stop down just a little bit f4. From f4, I can be at maybe f5 or f5.6, two-thirds of a stop, one stop, 
If I can do that, I not only get a slightly sharper image, but I'm getting a little bit extra, and not, not much, but a little bit extra depth of field to compensate for slight motion in the bird, get that eye sharp. The other reason why aperture is so important is that as soon as you put a teleconverter on your lens, if you've got one that supports a teleconverter, you lose that stop of light, and teleconverters tend to slightly degrade the image quality. So with a teleconverter, it's really important to be able to stop down just a little bit up to a stop to get the sharpest possible image with your teleconverter. So manual exposure mode, automatic ISO, dial in two thousandth of a second if you can, uh, let ISO vary, dial in slightly stop down from wide open so you get the maximum possible quality. And what I have found is by using those settings, my keeper rate has gone up dramatically. Uh, I'm freezing more motion, things just look sharper, and I'm not thinking, do I have a focus problem or some other settings problem? That's the, really the way to roll. So we've gotten to our location, set up our camera, set up our lenses. Let me tell you a little bit about the blinds of, of South Texas and show you some images. This is an example of one of the blinds we photographed at down in South Texas. This is a large sunken blind. It's in front of a large pond. You can see some purchase setup. This is actually one of the larger setups we have. But the important thing to consider when shooting from a blind is that not only are you hidden, um, but also that the perches and the features are set up for you because you're not going to be able to move around much. So one of the things that I really like about shooting down on these private ranches is that the owners there are photographers as well, and they really go through painstaking efforts to set up everything to maximize your chances of not only seeing the animals, but capturing them in a photograph with a clean background and a dynamic pose. So with these water holes in the summertime a lot of the animals will just start coming in because they're hot and thirsty and they want to drink. Here is the view uh, looking out from one of the blinds. This is kind of what it's like to be in one. This is a different blind and here you can see that there's some cactus and some other perches set up and you're behind the camouflage netting and just the end of your camera pokes out. So that's my D4 on the 600 and you can see my Aquatech hood there um, on the camera and it works just great. Now once you're in the blinds, of course, the angle of view is very different. Now we're looking through a telephoto lens. This is a unique species to South Texas. This is a green jay and you got the late afternoon light. It's calling to another bird that's up out of the frame up and to the right. Um, so it's all puffed out. It's got its beak open. And when you sit in a blind for several hours like this and get practice, you can really start getting some dramatic shots, not just your typical uh, portraits. Here's a painted bunting which is a very colorful species, really popular. And notice it came into the water hole to take a drink and I got a reflection on it. You can see that really smooth out of focus background. That's because I was at a close range with a telephoto lens. Here's that green jay again. And this is actually a crop from a D800E image. And I cropped it way in and I still got tremendous detail in the flowers. So if you've got a high resolution camera, if you're willing to sacrifice a little bit in the frame rate, the D800 only shoots four frames a second, uh, you can make it up with some incredibly detailed images. In the spring, the babies sometimes are out. These are baby scaled quail coming in to get a drink and you get the reflections in the pond there. Here again is a green jay and this guy I got capturing a moth and I just got lucky. Uh, burst rate 10 frames a second and I've got it shoot, uh, eating a little snack there on the moth. Here's another really charismatic species that we get down in South Texas. We've got some blinds set up down there for crested caracara. They're a, in the falcon family and they're really impressive. They come in and uh, they get right down on the ground and we get just gobs of shots of these, of these uh, animals. They're just beautiful. Other animals, maybe not as charismatic. This is a white-winged dove, but it's got the nice blue eyeliner. But what I liked about this shot, as you can see, it's got some reflection in the pond. And the grass hedge there is, uh, adds a little dimension to this shot. So we've got foreground, middle ground, and then a nice smooth background. We're also able to capture a lot of images of the birds doing behaviors. So here's a red-winged blackbird calling. And by timing my burst just right, I get it not only close up, but performing a behavior. Some species are not visible from the blinds. We actually took a, sh a short hike to see this screech owl 
in its tree and fortunately for us the the guys who own the ranch they took us out and they know where these birds are and, and we were able to get some photographs of them you almost don't even see them you have to look for it really carefully if you don't notice it it's looking back at us it's in the the upper center of the frame with a little practice we're able to get some flight shots it takes a little luck, a little patience, and good settings. So here is an immature white-winged dove taking off from the uh, water hole. Here's a male northern cardinal coming into land on one of the perches. And here's a different cardinal at a different uh, blind, but you, I've got it drinking and you get the nice reflection there in the water. A lot of the shooting locations have blinds that are dug into the ground, so we're shooting from a lower position that allows you to get these reflections. Not everything that comes to the blind is a bird. I mean, here's a cottontail rabbit. And I would be remiss to talk about Texas without mentioning the fact that, yes, there are snakes. And this is a very large, about a five and a half foot western diamondback rattlesnake. Uh, it was actually off to the side of the path, and our guide showed us where it was, so we weren't in any danger of stepping on it, and we were able to get some shots. I captured this image with my 70 to 200 zoom at 200 millimeters, so you get an idea. You can get pretty close to that. So there you have it, a little field trip to the photography blinds of South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, it's a wonderful place. I lead the workshop there every year. I'm working on my 2015 workshop. Um, one of the great things about it, besides the photography, is that it's all-inclusive. We stay at a private lodge. We've got all meals, um, nice cold drinks waiting for us when we get back in from a hot day of being in the blind. So if you're interested in something like that and you want to get those kinds of, of photos, regardless of your uh, skill level, uh, get in touch with me. Go to www.luminescentphoto.com workshops and click the link to get over to my meetup group. And if you register there, you'll be notified as soon as I get the photo safari on the calendar for next year, probably in the May-June time frame. So until then, I will see you next time. This is The Sensor Plane. I'm Jason O'Dell. Thanks again.